sort of system on chip design and processor design and the open risk project, sort of everything that everything we've been working on, but sort of the next level up. And following me, there'll be a talk from Jeremy about modeling things like systems on chip and sort of high level modeling of these designs. And then after that, we'll have a crack at getting some the open risk system on chip running on the V0 nanos. So the open risk practical session. Um, all right, so yeah, I'll give you a bit of an introduction on system on chip design, I guess you might say. If anyone, people might have seen these slides before, we gave this presentation at OSHOC, OSHOC about a year ago. But essentially, a system on chip is a thing with lots of functionality embedded in one um, design, I guess you'd say, one chip. So you've got your, uh, you know, things like the, the UART that we just worked on, that would only be a, a component of a bigger system. So you'd have many bits providing overall a lot of functionality. Um, you would have seen, uh, you know, people who've been in the industry many years will have seen this component of large integration of, of you know, great amount of integration into a single chip, um, a lot of functionality. So. I mean, we've seen a bit of the design process today where you write RTL and then you simulate it and you compile it and you put it on board, right? So essentially silicon chip design and system on chip design is the same thing. Uh, except your, what, what you do in the end is a slightly different compilation process. And instead of downloading to the board, you FTP it off to Taiwan <laughs> and give them a million dollars. Um, so this, this slide just talks about the process, you know, you, you plan your design, you do the design, you check the design. And you, uh, so this slide, we, this is a bit of a comparison between silicon chip design and FPGA design, but uh, as I said, essentially it's a different compilation process and it's a lot more expensive when you do a chip. Uh, but yeah, everything sort of in the early stages of the, the design is pretty much the same. Uh, so, going to talk a little bit about the cores that you put in systems on chip. Uh, yeah, so you'll, you'll specify the functionality that you want. Uh, you know, so for instance, for this DE0 nano board, uh, the open risk sock that we're going to use later, you know, I had to think about what, it, what there is on the board that I want to talk to and what protocols they use and so what controller cores I need. For instance, there's a SDRAM part on the bottom so I needed an SDRAM controller, IP block. There's an accelerometer which talks via either I2C or SPI. So I put in an SPI core to um, uh, talk to that guy. And of course LEDs in little GPIO, IP core, things like that. So you sort of piece these things together, build your system, and then use those things. Yeah, generally IP blocks, they, I guess kind of like libraries in software. So people will develop them and test them and make sure that the functionality works, but then they'll bundle them up and, and distribute them so that you can you know, just take that and plonk it down your design, or you know, if it's a bit of soft, the, the analogy for software would be you just link into those libraries, you know, you start. You have calls via the API, IP cores is sort of instantiated in your design, you know, instantiate a module and then hook things up to it so that it talks to it. Uh, yeah, so it's quite a big industry actually, IP core development. You know, you've got um, a number of design houses who will develop a core, you know, just say like Ethernet or encryption or something like that. And they will develop the core and package it and sell it to you for a lot of money. But there's also stuff on open cores, which <laughs> uh, all of the stuff that we're going to demo today is from. This is a little bit of a diagram on sort of how your system on chip comes together in block format, I guess. So you've got this guy up here is like your microprocessor. So typically in a system on chip, you're gonna have a microprocessor that sits there and is the brains of the operation. So he's synchronizing everything. And usually you're just writing C code, which is running on that processor to control everything. You could write assembly if you want or even a higher level language, but typically it's just sitting there doing a bunch of reads and writes over the system bus to control things. So hanging off your bus, that's your bus arbiter there or something that all your connections go through. 
Uh, you've got things like non-volatile non memory controllers, so an SPI flash reader, like a memory. But you can have on-chip memories, you can have off-chip memories, so you know, whether you've got an on-chip or off-chip. Sort of doesn't matter, your system's probably going to need a bit of memory anyway to store stuff for your processor or if you, you know, you've got a camera dumping in data for processing later, you're going to need a memory to store that. Uh, you know, special processing, so you might have a DSP core or some sort of image compression or decompression core or something. And usually I.O., general I.O. stuff, so like GPIO or push button interface or a UART or whatever. Um, <coughs> A large part of this work is actually not really piecing it together, but testing it. So we've been a bit lightweight on test benches this week. It's been more of a more of a um, put it on the board and see if it works kind of thing. But usually the development process involves a lot of testing, a lot of test bench writing, and a lot of time scratching your head wondering why something doesn't work, um, and verifying that you, you know you've tested all the common cases and thought about things. That's a large part of this process. Um, Less so for FPGA design because you know the cost of failure is not very high. You know, it doesn't work over. You know, we just fix it and re-download it. Um, of course, if you're building silicon chips, the cost of failure is a lot higher, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Uh, okay, so this section I'm going to talk about how we describe the hardware, but you already know about that because we've been doing that for the last two days. <laughs> so, um, talking about flip-flops, combinatorial, synchronous logic logical functions, editing modules, instantiating stuff. Probably one thing that's worth touching on is Verilog. And I saw I mentioned yesterday, you know, he likes to code in a very sort of explicit style, you know, you, you don't hide anything. But Verilog allows you to have some relatively high level constructs. Uh, well, there are relatively high level constructs in Verilog that you can use to say, well actually, in a good example is adding two numbers, right? So you just go something equals something plus one, it's incrementing it. But actually the, the logic to, in, to implement that, you know, can vary depending upon whether the synthesis tool is struggling to meet timing, or it's struggling in terms of area, or you tell it to optimize for power, or something like that. Uh, you could go in there and manually instantiate using sort of logical primitives. So you can sit there and just instantiate AND and NOT gates, uh, possibly OR and XOR gates as well, um, to increment very, very sort of, you know, logical sort of arithmetic functions like addition or multiplication or something. Um, so that's an example of a sort of a high level thing that you're abstracted away from the very low level workings of how it's being implemented. Uh, and you can get even higher level than that, so... Uh, well, if, if statements are a bit like that as well, you know, you could go in and manually specify what the logic of that if statement is, but it's a lot nicer to read, you know, an if-else statement. Case statements as well, so, you know, they're, they're not so high level, but um, they are not exactly what is being instantiated in the design. So, well, for loops is, a, is, a, is one. You could use a state machine for a for loop that to emulate a for loop, or you can write a for loop um, in hardware. It's going to be translated, uh, depending on the synthesis software, to, to a similar circuit. And it won't be what you might imagine as a one circuit in the iteration. It might scan that and replicate each instance and run it in parallel, depending on what performance you want to take from it, and if it can, uh, in terms of the data, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the Verilog, yeah, you can use it, you can write stuff that's dense code, but actually has a lot of functionality, or you can sort of flesh it out and be very explicit about what you're doing. Alright, so I'll introduce the Open Risk project now. Uh, it was a project started in about 1999 by a bunch of Slovenian university students who thought, hey, it'd be cool if there was an open source you know, microprocessor. And I agree with them, it's kind of fun because you know, everyone can work on it and it's a nice little project to, to have and, and use. So they started. Uh, this bloke, Damien Lampret, he was sort of the head guy, I think he was in charge of writing the processor at the time, so it's kicked off. and. 
Uh, there were a few other guys who got involved and started writing IP cores, and they started publishing these on the Open Cores website. And you know, over the years, they progressed the project, and they had a you know system on chip implementation, and they had a tool chain, and they had all sorts of peripherals which were working. And they were contracted by some, I think, American company Flextronics to go and fab some chips for use in, in various things. And then they started their own company and spun off and never committed a single thing further to the open source repository. So that was about 2005 or so. And the project lay dormant for a few years. It was on open cores. Then some boys in Sweden came along and said, hey, this is pretty cool. Um, actually, some of the guys who previously worked with the original team at Flextronics, um, they liked what they saw. And uh, Damian was trying to sell open cores. And, they came along and bought it up and started running it. And uh, they run a business in Sweden, a consulting business which uses all open source IP. If I used to work for them. This is how I got involved. Um, so they called Warsock. Anyway, they came along. They bought Open Cores. They now maintain it and run it. They run a business using the technology. I guess since about then they've reinvigorated the project and they kind of improved the website and employed people like me to hack on it. Slowly but surely, the project's been growing ever since then. Uh, so to explain a little, bit, a little bit about what the Open Risk is, in terms of the CPU architecture, it's like a very basic 80s risk, and where we're risk being produced in instruction set computer. I explained that a little bit on the wiki, a nice little sort of comparison between what a risk architecture and a CIS, or a complex instruction set architecture, <coughs> um, what the differences are. So open risk obviously is a risk one, and it's very basic. It's actually based very closely upon uh, an example ISA given in a Hennessy and Patterson. They wrote a, which had a demo architecture called DLX, and open risk is, oh, and DLX turned into MIPS essentially. Yeah, so MIPS. Hennessy and Patterson. Patterson did the first risk, which was risk one, and Hennessy, um, who is now uh, head of the university, did the first. Processor and, and, and uh, which led to the um, risk one became Spark. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these, these are big cheeses. Yes. <laughs> the idea is that, you know, uh, you know, Intel 86 series PCs or processors that had been around for a while, and uh, the idea was make the hardware complex so the software could be relatively you know, simple. But, they sort of turn that approach on their head by saying, well, actually, we should make the hardware simpler and make the compiler software do optimization and ordering and you know, figure out the best way to you know, run these algorithms. So it's good in a way, I guess. One of the things that we suffer from in this project, I think, is the instructions are quite big. So we, we haven't got modern uh, advances like you know, more dense versions of the instructions. Hopefully, that, that's the problem. But anyway, it's a very basic 32-bit wide instruction word that does very basic things just like register to register arithmetic, load and store, and that's about it. By load store, I mean store something in memory or access something from memory. Very basic addressing modes. There's, there's other nice features of the architecture, like we have an NMU specification and some caches, so we can run nice operating systems that are relatively high rate. This is talking about, all right, so that's the architecture. We then had the first implementation of a compliant, of an architecture compliant CPU. So, you know, a CPU designed to run open risk code, essentially. And that was the OR1200, and that was written by the original team. And until recently, it was still really the only major implementation. Uh, it's a very simple five stage pipeline. So, you, you know, the code starts off, fetches an instruction from memory checks out what that instruction is in the next stage by decoding it into a bunch of control signals for various bits of the pipeline. In the next stage, you know, if it was told to add two numbers, it would have already got those two numbers out of the register file. It then adds them together. The next stage, uh, it will, if it added two numbers or it fetched something from memory, it will then write those things back into its register file. And I think the final stage, ah, uh, is that five or no, no, there's another stage which sort of synchronizes everything well, you know, if you've done something illegal, it will trap and go to a different address to handle that and things like that. So that's a five-stage CPU, uh, and it was 
relatively fully featured, so you can run Linux on this guy. And has timers, interrupts, caches. Uh, and of course, CPU by itself is not much use. You need, as I've explained, like a system around it, memory and uh, interfaces and things like that. So they developed like a reference system on chip, just like an example implementation uh, called OrpSoc, the Open Risk Reference Platform System on Chip. That was a project that I worked on initially, and yeah, it's a very generic sort of SOC. So the idea is that you can go on any FPGA family. So anything that's specific to any technology, we sort of if def that out, so it's optionally there. Um, today, with the demo, we're going to be working on a, a derivative of this. It's one I've developed for the CPU that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, this is talking about. All right, so yeah, when we talk about the Open Risk project, though, there's actually quite a bit involved. There's not only the architecture specification itself. You then got things like the implementation of the CPU and reference systems on chip to test the CPU. You've then got simulator models, so we have a C model, so instead of having you know, the RTL do the number crunching, we'd have a C description of how that number crunching goes on, that obviously runs a lot faster. Compile it on your multi gigahertz x86 machine and it goes like stick. But, of course, you know, that only gets you so far. <laughs> you know, at some stage you want to run these things on the chip, so that's obviously not a synthesizable model. Uh, in terms of simulator models, we have, so that one, AUXIN, written C. <coughs> the system on chip can be compiled into a cycle accurate model, which actually runs pretty quick. Uh, Jeremy's going to talk about this a little bit later. And we have, obviously we can simulate the RTL model, just like what we've been doing in ModelSim. Anyway, we also have tons of tools involved. In terms of software, so you've got a compiler, so you have an assembler, a compiler, a linker, a debugger, you have libraries, you have uh, software that runs on the architecture, like bootloaders, operating systems, then you have debug infrastructure, so things, once it's running on the board, to actually go in and talk to the processor and tell it to stop, read register, write register, go, things like that. So there's actually quite a bit involved to make this a viable development platform. It's kind of interesting. Jeremy will probably talk about this a little bit more later. So we're going to see how you can talk to this design. So you'll go and synthesize a design and put it on, and essentially these designs are just like lots more RTL. So you're dealing with maybe 100 lines of RTL today. I think we've got about 4,000 just in the CPU for the project that I've been working on recently. Probably about another 10,000 in the system on chip design. So it's a little bit of code, but it's all the same stuff. Just toggle this register <coughs> on this condition, and <laughs> pretty much. Um, but anyway, so you can talk to this design. So you take all that, compile it, run it in, in the synthesis tool, and download it to your FPGA. And then you'll use some tools to go and talk to that and you know run code and tell it to stop start, tell me this register, write that register. But we can also do that against like a C model, so that's quite handy because you'll write some code and it won't behave on the board and you'll go, oh, what's going on? And then you'll go and run the exact same code against your C model using the exact same debug interface, so you'll use GDB to connect and download the code and run it and be like, aha, that's what's wrong. Because if you run against the software model, you can actually tell that to dump a trace or something, you know, and see exactly what you've done. Uh, so that's quite a handy feature. Uh, Alright, using OpSoc. We'll get onto this in the, the practical bit, I think, a little bit later. But essentially, yeah, I mean, you, you, the basics for a little system that you can use is something which allows the CPU to run and do stuff. So you need some memory and a bus so it can talk to different things and the debug interface. But then also something to allow to talk to the outside world, so a UART, for instance, or um, other boards have an Ethernet connector, so you have a little core which allows it to talk over the network, and that's quite handy because then you can just plug your board in and run Linux or something on it and SSH into it, and then do things that way. It's quite handy. Um, all right, so this is just instructions on how to run OpSoc. We don't need to know about this right now. Yeah. Is there a speed limitation? How fast is it run compared to an ARM or something? On FPGA, you get certain 
implementations up to maybe 100 megahertz. On the board, we were running at 50 today. And if you hear me, it's just completely hardware, it's whatever, yeah, the stick in the hardware. Yeah, as well as the implementation. So if, if you're doing like apples for apples, then maybe, you know, uh, yeah, I'd buy it. You have to specify what that apple is as well, but um, yeah. anyway, yeah, it's a wide variety depending upon how many pipeline stages you have and how much area you have in the SPGA. So that's a little bit of an introduction into the Open Risk Project and systems on chip and how you work with them. We'll go through more in a practical session later, but I just sort of wanted to prime everyone with that. And then Jeremy's going to talk a little bit more about modeling stuff. So, yeah. Can you give some examples of where you'd use this or where it's been used uh, instead of for commercial? Outside my bedroom now. Uh, all right, no, it has been used. We used to do work in Sweden in industrial uh, use cases. So people like the fact that you have all the code, right, for your entire system. You're not reliant upon, you know, some black box of a chip with a specified interface that you might not be able to buy in five years' time. So, so it's not so much an economic driver as a... As a sort of, you know, you have access to the entire design sort of thing. Right. If you get um, a Samsung set of box in that cabinet in there, if you go to Samsung's website, they are very good about the open source. You can get the barrel. Yeah, so um, it's, it's... It's also going around the world in tech at SAM, um, which is an educational SAM, right? Yes. Okay. Which have failed to actually release their RTLs, I should do. Uh, yes. So uh, what, what, what device is this? Is this GPL? It's LGPL. The, oh, 1200 is LGPL, yeah. Is it an American side, right? Uh, to, yeah, it's NASA. Yeah, because they can be very sticky about it. it's hot. No, it's... I don't think it's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's not them. But uh, no, industrial applications certainly. So people like the ability to be able to take that exact same design that's controlling that robot and put it on another FPGA, and they can't buy that particular FPGA in five or ten years' time. Um, no vendor locking as well is another selling point. You have I don't know, yeah, people who just want to have all the source. So one of the reasons I think why these um, we did some work for a company in Sweden who were ended up and selling it on to maybe military or space contractors is because then they can see the exact. The whole design and know what's in there. 